So the writer writes this. I was driving with a friend on Flag Day when he turned to me and said, seeing all those flags on display makes me so proud of my country. But Chen, you're Chinese. I replied, all those flags are American. No, they're not, he laughed, just look at the label. <laughs> made where? Like everything else, made in China. I hope we could change that one day. Made in America. Luke chapter 18, 9 to 13 says this. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus was preaching, well, actually teaching about being prideful. It says that he was talking to people who were like this. He was speaking to them. It says, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. He focused it on people who needed to hear it, who were being prideful. They were confident of their own righteousness. They looked down on everyone else. Jesus warns us not to be prideful. 1 John chapter 2, 15 and 16, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Being prideful is of the world. Being prideful. It's okay to be proud of, like, for instance, your children's accomplishments. That's, that's a simple pride. That's not what, you, what is being prideful. It's okay to be simply proud if you, you know, if you get a 10-point buck, I'm proud of that shot I made. It's okay to be proud of that. It's not okay to live a prideful attitude and a prideful life, though. He's warning us not to be prideful. Um, there is a pride that causes, uh, crosses a line. Boastful, arrogant, conceited, those are symptoms of being prideful. The example of the Pharisee. We're placed on this earth to praise God, to bring glory to God. We're placed on this earth to worship God. Carol's mom used to get down sometime because of her physical condition and they didn't have a home anymore. They'd have to live with us. And she said, I don't know why God put me on this earth. And I'd say to her, he put you here to worship him. That's what we are here for. When we get to where we think we're on this earth for our benefit, then we cross a line because we're here to do God's will and to worship Him. Amen? Amen. Thank you. The sign is right there, but I thought I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't have to use it. So we cross a line if we go into being prideful. The same line that Satan crossed when he got thrown out of heaven. He was the worship leader in heaven. And he wanted that worship for himself. And he crossed the line. And God threw him out of heaven. 
King David decided that he needed to take a census of Israel. Why? Well, some possibility, we don't really know exactly why. I have an idea of what my theory is why, but some possibilities. Maybe he was getting ready to tax them. Maybe his kids needed shoes, so he had to levy a tax. <laughs> Maybe he just wanted to know how many, how many subjects he had as king. But actually what he was trying to find out was how many men he could raise an army. That's what he was trying to find out, how many men there were who could handle a sword. So maybe he wanted to know what the resources would be in a time of war. Maybe that's what he wanted to know. Whatever the motive was, this thing was displeasing to God. It was offensive to God that, that David wanted to take this inventory across Israel for his knowledge and, and use. He crossed a line that put him outside of God's will. In the chapter before, this was in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. But in the chapter before that, in chapter 20, David and his men had won a great victory over the Philistines. In 1 Chronicles 20, 4 to 8, it says this, In the course of time, war broke out with the Philistines at Gezer. At that time, Sibachai the Hushathite killed Sippai, one of the descendants of the Rephaites, and the Philistines were subjugated. In other words, they won. In another battle with the Philistines, El uh, Elhanan, son of Jair, killed Lachmi, the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, who had a spear like a sh like, uh, with a shaft like a weaver's rod. In still another battle, which took place at Gath, there was a huge man with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in all. He also was a descendant from Rapha. They were giants. When he taunted Israel, Jonathan, son of Shimei, David's brother, killed him. These were the descendants of Rapha in Gath, and they fell at the hands of David and his men. So David must at this point be becoming very confident in his military prowess. He's experiencing a lot of victories. At one time, he had spent some time on the run from King Saul, who was trying to kill him. But outside of that, for the most part, he had always had a military victory of sorts, one, of, one sort or another. But in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, the first five verses, and we're going to go back to chapter 20 in a second here, but it says this, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. This was David's idea coming from the devil. It wasn't God's idea. And this wasn't the only time that David had ever done something that displeased God. But this one was very serious and it cost many lives. Satan incited David. Incited, it says. Satan's plan in coming against Israel. What better way to derail God's plan for the nation than to get the king to do something that would displease God, that would put him on the wrong side, on the outs, on a separation from God himself. Satan would love to destroy Israel because his nemesis, Satan's destroyer, would come through Israel. Jesus, the Son of God, would come from the line of David. So naturally, Satan would attack that line. Satan had already been defeated, but he never stops trying to destroy the work of God. Satan is the tempter. 
the one who incites in this verse he's the master of sneaky temptations he knows what every person's weaknesses are and he probes your weaknesses and as soon as you get a victory over him in that one he starts on someone on another one <laughs> he really does now if you go back to chapter 20 we talked about the victories in Gath and so it says in in verse 2 David took the crown from the head of their king its weight was found to be a talent of gold and it was set with precious stones and it was placed on David's head he took a great quantity of plunder from the city gold and jewels on the head of David gold and jewels could it be that David is getting prideful with a big crown with gold and jewels and look at me all of my victories look at me gold and jewels I got a fancy crown I'm gonna walk around with this thing on my head a garish symbol of victory over the Philistines could it be that David thought he won the victory without God's help? God was always in the victory. God's always in your victory. God is in the victory. You don't need to walk around with gold and jewels on your head to bring attention to yourself. You know, we're all proud of our accomplishments. We're proud of our children. But pridefulness is connected with the things like being arrogant, conceited and thinking that we're better than others the sinful type of pride that separates us from God so we continue back in chapter 21 in verse 2 so David said to Joab and I think actual the pronunciation of that would be Joab but anyway he and the commanders of the troops Go and count the Israelites from Beersheba to Dan. Then report back to me so that I may know how many there are. So what's so bad about counting your assets? What was it about this inventory that put David on the wrong side of God? What was so odious to God about this action? Why is it that God didn't want David to determine how many Israelites, more specifically, how many fighting men were in Israel? Why was this offensive to God? Could being a successful ruler on the, and, and success on the battlefield be going to his head like the gold and jewels did God had given David victories God gave him the victories so far I mean he was able to kill a lion and a bear with his bare hands he was able to kill Goliath he won favor with Solomon at first he was able to avoid being captured or killed by Solomon's armies when Solomon's attitude toward him changed he subdued the nations around him he defeated the Philistines their arch enemies so maybe this inventory that he wanted to take was a sign that David was going to make his own decisions about his military battles instead of leaning on God maybe his victories uh, had gone to his head just like the gold and the jewels there was weight in those gold in that gold and jewels it would it will weigh you a talent of gold is heavy it would weigh you down verse 3 but Joab replied my Lord multiply may the Lord multiply his troops a hundred times over my Lord the king are then on all my Lord's subjects why does my Lord want to do this why should he bring guilt on Israel see Joab had an insight 
into this offense against God, Joab understood why this was offensive to God. And David did not. David is, was wrapped up in his own self at this point. He had sinful pride, pridefulness, which Jesus warns us not to be like that. Was Joab or Joab more in tune with God's will and his displeasure than David was? At first, David was directly involved with the military campaigns. Then he started to stay back in Jerusalem. That's what happened when, when he had the discretion, indiscretion with Bathsheba. They went out to war and he stayed back there. He, he wasn't in the battle. That made, a weak, uh, that made him weak. He wasn't in the battle. But he started to stay back in Jerusalem and send the armies out under the leadership of his general, Joab, who was in charge of the armies. So Joab then was the one that was in the battle, and he was able to see the hand of God at work in the battles. And David didn't do that. He stayed back. He held back. When you don't go out in the battle, then you're, you're doing your own creature comfort thing. If you go out with the army, you probably have to sleep on the ground or in a tent or something. Now he's the king. So he sends out the army, but he ministers to his own self back home. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way, does it, brother? In the military, the, the, the officers have to be out there leading, right? So he started hanging out back in, in Jerusalem. And Joab then was in the battles and he saw the hand of God. He knew where the victories came from. And he knew that this inventory was offensive to God. So Joab was alarmed at what David was asking him to do. He was alarmed. So there must have been a dramatic change in the way David ruled the land. And more specifically in his decision making. There was a shifting from David's dependence on God to depending on his own ability and resources. And that's why he wanted to know what these resources were. In other words, David was operating in pride instead of humility. We need to be in humility, not sinful pride. I'm going to have to make one of these with the light on it. <laughs> I'll put it right at hand's reach there. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Then in verse 4, the king's word, however, overruled Joab. So Joab left and went through Israel and came back to Jerusalem. Joab, verse 5, reported the number of the fighting men to David. In all Israel, there were 1,100,000 men who could handle a sword, including 470,000 in Judea. So almost half of the army was in Judea itself. Verse 6, but Joab did not include Levi and Benjamin in the numbering because the king's command was repulsive to him. So he wouldn't even finish the counting because this was so offensive to, to Joab. It was repulsive to him that he didn't even finish it. He gave a report. He thought, this is good enough. I'm not doing any more of this because it's offensive to God. So this command, verse number seven, was also evil in the sight of God, so he punished Israel. In verse 20, in verse 8 of chapter 21, we see David's repentance. David was a master repenter. He always repents, but he makes a lot of stupid blunders. And this was one of them. 
Verse 8, then say, David said to God, I have sinned greatly by doing this. You know, you can't erase it. You can't take it back. You can't say, well, take those numbers away from me. I have sinned greatly by doing this. Now I beg, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. So now even David recognizes that this inventory was foolish. Because it was based on himself and his pride and his ability to marshal those resources and win battles instead of depending on God himself. David always recognizes his sin after he does it. After he does it. We need to be careful to recognize what may be displeasing to God and don't do it. David's not a good example of staying out of sin. He's a good example of being in repentance. But he crosses from pride in this verse into humility. It seems uh, that he's instantly aware that he has offended God. And David cries out for forgiveness. He cries out. And he's forgiven, but there's a judgment to pay. In 1 Chronicles 21, 12, he's offered three possible judgments, three punishments. One of them is three years of famine. One of them is three months of being swept away before your enemies with their swords overtaking you. And the third one is, or three days of the sword of the Lord, days of plague in the land, with the angel of the Lord ravaging every part of Israel. Now then, decide how I should answer the one who sent me. So he's got these three possibilities, and all of them are destruction of people who had nothing to do with his guilt. So he chooses the plague, the sword of the Lord, and 70,000 perished. 70,000 people perished at the sword of the Lord. A large part of what had been numbered in this inventory is now destroyed. It went in to David's heart that this sin had caused this loss of life. And David would carry the guilt of this loss. That he had caused the death of so many because of the sin of pride that he gave in to when he ordered Yoab to take this inventory. David, it seems, was looking to glorify himself. He didn't recognize that, but Yoab did recognize that. Sometimes when we're on the wrong side of God, someone might have to give us a little poke, <laughs> a little jab, a wake-up call. Hey, man, what you're doing doesn't please God. You better think about it. Today, we see arrogance in high places. Watch the news. It seems that, you know, some of the people in Washington believe their own lies. We need humility. We need love. We need God. Marxism and socialism hate religion, all religion, they hate it. They want to be the religion. The high-placed political powers in our beloved nation are bent on destroying the very foundation that this nation was founded on, Judeo-Christian ethical standards, are under attack constantly. There's no consideration of God's will in their legislating. No consideration. God is pushed out, pushed aside. As a nation, we're on a collision course with God. God is not mocked. He will have his way. 
And we will see that. Whether we see it here or see it from heaven, it's coming and it's going to happen. Here's a description, Revelation chapter 14. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horses' bridles, for a distance of 16,000 stadia. This is a figurative glimpse into the end of all those who believed in themselves instead of believing in God. The end is near. It's coming. We can't slow it down. We can't put it off. We need to pray for revival. We need to all be praying for revival. We need to be praying for humility in high places where there isn't any. Just a few. We need to pray for humility in high places, even in the high places in churches. Amen. There are churches where there's no humility, where the pastors are multimillionaires. And you can see the sin of pridefulness. There's nothing wrong with being a millionaire. But pridefulness puts you on the wrong side of God, just as it did David. Second Chronicles 7, 14 of my people, you know this verse, were called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. This humbling has to start with individual believers. Then in the churches, my people, if my people, has to start with us. If my people, not the sinners, if my people will humble themselves and pray. It starts with us. There's no greater example of humility than Jesus. Philippians 2. Do nothing out of selfish ambitions or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. We're supposed to practice that. Verse 4. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God, something to be used to his own advantage. Verse 7, rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You want to be like Jesus? He went to the cross so we wouldn't have to. But the humility, we do have to. Value others. How do you do that? If you value someone, then you want them to be blessed. You want them to be well. You want them to prosper. And most of all, you want them to be saved. You want them to escape the law of sin and death just as you have. Value others above yourselves. Can we be too prideful to be soul winners? Can we be too prideful, prideful to just go up to somebody and hint around a little bit and look if there's an open door to talk about Jesus? Can we do, be too prideful, prideful to do that? Can we be too prideful to be demonstrative in our worship? We come together to glorify God, to worship Him. And we sit through the service. 
we sit through the worship. You know, in churches we've been in before, people all came down the altar and came around and raised their hands, and some of them would dance around a little bit. And maybe this church was like that before. I don't know. I wasn't here when it was like that, if it was. But that's what Pentecostal churches do, that's what they're like. Can we be too prideful to do that? Can we? Was in a, I was in a, the one church in uh, uh, Freedens, and we were there for eight months. And all I would do is walk up to the pulpit and go like this, and every single person would come down and, and stand down and worship. And eventually I got them where, they, where I didn't have to do that. <laughs> every, eventually I got them where they would come and, de, and be demonstrative in worship. It was a wonderful thing. Some would kneel. And it was a wonderful thing. Pride. It's okay to be proud, simple pride. But to be proudful, prideful. That puts us on the wrong side of what God wants to do. It put David on the wrong side. 70,000 people died because of it. David on the wrong side. I want to be on the right side. <laughs> I want to make sure that I don't get that I don't get proud. I mean, I can be proud. I, mean, I was proud when this church hired me. I took a picture of myself with a selfie with a sign down there to show it to my brother. But that wasn't a pridefulness that ruled out humility in my life. I shouldn't talk about myself, but I know me. <laughs> so we need God's help Amen. to be humble. We need Jesus' example to be humble. We sing a song to be like Jesus. That's all I ask, to be like him. But what was he like? He was humble. He was humble. That's what we need to be. Humble. Amen? Would you stand? We love this church, Lord. We love this church. And we don't know what you have in store for this church, Lord. We know what we would like to see, but we don't know what we have to do to make that happen. But we will humble ourselves before you and do it if you show us, Lord. We have love for each other in this church. That should be something that draws people. We have good worship in this church, Lord. It should be something that draws people. And we have drawn people. It's a mystery. It's a mystery to us why they don't stay. But Lord, we trust that you have things, uh, great things in mind for this church, Lord. And uh, we, we will get out of the way, if we're in the way, Lord, of this happening. We will just step aside and watch miracles happen, Lord. Because we know that you can do that. So we're just, we're just uniting this little body together and saying, Lord, what we can do, show us. And we'll be humble enough to do it. Bless these people today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.